This is the hinge. And then there are folds like this one here, which are really quite sharply changing orientation, and they are called chevron folds. Chevron folds. This is just nomenclature that you have to remember so that if I tell you that it is a rounded mm -hmm, anticline that you are actually able to draw it. Okay. Now, let's have a look at the thickness of a layer in a fold. This is a marble from one of the areas of the field courses that we are teaching. Here is a coin for the scale. And here is a marble layer. And what you can see is that here it is about this thick, but when you go across the hinge, the layer is actually much thicker. Okay? So this is certainly not simply a layer which has been bent, because then it would be everywhere the same thickness. There has been a little bit more to it. And in the textbook of Ramsey, there is a method to actually measure this change in thickness around a fold. And it is called the method of the deep isogons. Okay? What you do is you make a drawing of the fold, and you draw the two sides of the layer, and then you put a little grid on it, and you measure the, thick, the distance between the layer, between the line that is touching the outside and the other line which is touching the inside of the fold. And you measure this distance. And then you turn your grid and you measure it again. And every time you write down this angle alpha, which is the angle of the grid and some kind of a reference direction. And then what you do is you plot this alpha against the thickness. So, the most simple case, if you would take your notebook and bend it, just like this, that everywhere the thickness is the same. So, you get a horizontal line in your plot. These are called parallel or concentric folds. The thickness of the layer is everywhere the same. And this one here is a very interesting one. This is the class 2 fold. This is a similar fold. In this particular example, I can make a little sketch for you. The fold looks like this. And now, this distance is the same. You can measure it in this direction, and it's always the same. This is the class 2, or similar folds. So, what you do is you go into the field, you take a photograph of a fold, and you do this measurement and plot it in this diagram, this is the class 2, this is the class 3, and this is the class 1c fold. Okay. So, now let's go, after we have seen all the nomenclature and the shapes and the sizes, let's go and try to understand a little bit about the mechanics of folds. And to do that, I will concentrate a little bit on single layer folding. What I mean with single layer folding is that you have a big homogeneous rock and inside it there's just one layer of something else and that is folded. So here, this is a mica schist and here is a marble layer. And I'm going to try to understand a little bit about why these folds are like that. A beautiful example is this one here that I found when I was a student in the Pyrenees. This is a thin sandstone layer. It was embedded in a claystone, which has now fallen off. 
and you can see how the layer is folded around like this. What is very interesting is that here on the outside the layer is rounded but here in the inside of the fold there is a very sharp tip. This has a name. This is called a pigmatic fold. Here's the name. This is a pigmatic fold. And there are very good reasons why this actually happens like that. And uh, uh, I can explain to you in the next year's course, Advanced Structural Geology. So now, one property of these kind of folds is that the wavelength, okay, so what is a wavelength? It is basically the distance between the two hinges, okay? The wavelength is very simply correlated to the thickness of the layer. So if you have a thick layer, the wavelength is very large. If you have a thin layer, the wavelength is very small. And this has been plotted in quite a famous diagram. This is from the book by Sapi. Here is the logarithm of the fold wavelength. And look at this. This is 10 centimeter and this is 100 kilometers. It's quite a diagram. And here it is the thickness of the layer which is being folded. One millimeter and one kilometer. And there is actually a very good correlation. So thin layers from short wavelengths, thick layers correspondingly long wavelengths. If you look at folds like this, you can learn a lot about the strain in these folds. Okay? Strain analysis was uh, discussed in one of the earlier lectures. And if you are lucky to, a to analyze, to be able to analyze the strain in folds like this, then what you see is that there is this neutral surface in the middle. Okay? And in this neutral surface, there is no strain at all. But outside, in the arc, the rock is extending, and inside, the rock is being shortened. So there is a lot of deformation in this layer itself. And of course, if the rock is strong, then it will actually resist this deformation. So now we are getting into a little bit of the understanding of mechanics, of the mechanics of folds. And the first concept that you have to understand here is the concept of buckling. Buckling. Buckling, in German it is knicken. Okay? And the demonstration is very simple. This, here is a plastic stick that I bought from my office and I want to shorten this stick. So I hold it here, put it on the table and now I push it down. Okay? And what happens? It bends. It, the reason for that is that it is not stiff enough to resist the forces which, is, which are trying to push it outwards so that it can shorten. This instability will be not there if this is made out of steel, which is much stronger. Okay? But if I would take a steel stick and make it ten times as long and I push it down, it would also buckle. There is a critical combination of thickness, elasticity, and slenderness of the layer. And then always it will buckle when you want to shorten it. Okay? Of course, layers are very long. And in that respect, the ratio between the length and the thickness is very, very big. So if you want to shorten layers, then they will buckle. So buckling, in fact, knicken, is a very common way 
of destabilizing a layer in the earth. If you look at this little demo, then one thing is always done or always seen when I shorten it that the wavelength of the fold which I form is the maximum possible. Okay? I, there's nothing I can do by pushing this rod together to get folds like this. Okay? And the reason is that the air outside this little experiment is of course very, very soft. So this stick is so much more strong that mechanically the air has very little possibility to actually work against this bending. Now it turns out that if you want to do this buckling experiment with a layer between two other layers, then the story is very different. And to be able to go into that, we will need to learn the concept of viscosity. Okay, what is viscosity? You remember the, my lecture about material properties where I explained to you the power low creep equation. The rate of straining is a material constant times the exponential of minus q of rt times sigma 1 minus sigma 3 to the power n. And this is a very general description of a very complex fluid which will deform by this rheological law. Now let's try to make this equation a little simpler. And we make n is here equals 1. And we keep the temperature constant. Then what I can write is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by the strain rate is a constant and it is written by this letter and this number here is called viscosity. The units are of course Pascal times second. Strain rate is 1 divided by second. So stress divided by 1 divided by second is stress times second, Pascal second. And many rocks have a viscosity. Of course, water or oil have a very low viscosity. And rocks can have a billion times higher, but still viscosity. They will flow if you load them and wait for a long time. So the next picture is the result of an experiment done by a colleague of mine at the ETH Zurich. If one of you is interested, you can go and do an MSc uh, thesis in this laboratory and make your own faults. So what my colleague has done is he made a big block of a viscous material. Okay? And he had, in this experiment, two different viscosities. In the middle, there is the first viscosity and outside the second viscosity. And then he shortened this block like this. And what you see is that quite far away from this layer, the deformation is rather...